Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kelly here with Esri and I would like to welcome you to our webinar today, Transforming an MSDI into a Modern Hydrospatial Infrastructure. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our presenters today, Rafael Ponce and Sean Morish. Okay, thank you, Kelly. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world today. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, as mentioned in the title, we will discuss the concepts of a marine spatial data infrastructure and how this can be the conduit for organizations, either uh, governmental organizations or private organizations, civilian or military, to transform into what uh, can be considered a marine geospatial agency, or as we like to call them, hydrospatial. So before we start, uh, we would like to introduce ourselves, uh, the presenters today. So as Kelly said, my name is Rafael Ponce and I work in ESRI as a global maritime consultant. I'm a retired captain from the Mexican Navy after 25 years of service there. Uh, I'm also a professional mariner and I was a deputy director of hydrography and cartography uh, in, in the Navy and among other positions. I'm a category A hydrographer and I have represented Mexico in different uh, uh, IHO committees and working groups and uh, joined S3 a few years ago. Sean? Good evening as well. Um, my name is Sean Morris. I am with the 3D team in product development here in Esri in Redlands. My background is I'm a civil engineer by trade, um, do a lot of remote sensing, so LIDAR, uh, hydro, and that. And my job is primarily focused on development and um, implementation of voxel layers and other three-dimensional feature services, both in pro and also on the web. Thank you, Sean. So these are the specific topics that we are going to cover today, uh, from the current situation in the world to the trends, the new technologies and opportunities now and in the near future. So today's world is very different from what we used to know. Uh, we face some uncertainty, uncertain times ahead of us. Uh, the economies around the world are suffering, but if there is one thing this pandemic taught us uh, in our field is that number one, there is a great need for geospatial information and it's becoming more important than ever before. Uh, number two, the organizations uh, need to continue their operations with their staff working remotely and in some cases also in disconnected environments. And number three, uh, these organizations need to take advantage of the so-called fourth industrial revolution or the cyber physical systems and use all available technologies to ensure that information keeps flowing from important planning and decision making. And the continuity of operations from any place should be enabled as much as possible. And this is an opportunity to adapt uh, using cutting edge technology taking into account that people need and use data for almost any decision every day. And organizations can also take advantage of uh, the new standards. Uh, we will see this in more detail. So first, let's take a look into the key drivers that are guiding and making organizations evolve into marine uh, geospatial organizations or hydrospatial organizations. Uh, first, natural phenomena such as climate change and as a consequence of it, the sea level rise are growing concerns among governments, among uh, organizations and, and, and communities and how to respond effectively and efficiently and adapt to those changes are, are common challenges. Also, new technologies in the maritime world, such as the development of autonomous ships, which is, I think, a consequence of the fourth industrial revolution, are creating a new type of customer. Uh, 
uh, with new needs and demands. And the International Maritime Organization, through their e-navigation initiative, that by the way has been around for a few years, uh, as the framework to modernize and, and improve safe berth-to-berth -berth navigation, connecting ships with shore-based services and authorities is also one of those trends that, that are driving changes. And maritime ports requiring to be more modern and efficient, uh, some of them developing their digital twins, uh, are also uh, demanding uh, new systems and new ways of accessing uh, and disseminating their information. And some international initi initiatives, such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, that are providing a framework for sustainable development, uh, and of which the blue economy is an important part of. And projects like the Decade of the Ocean Science, and they say the science we need for the ocean we want, is also very important. And the Seabed 2030 project uh, are influencing how organizations uh, are evolving and changing to face those new challenges. So here we're going to have a, a poll. We're going to have three polls today. The first poll uh, that I, we would like you to kindly answer is this question. What's the main mission of your organization? And I see today in our audience that uh, there is a majority that is uh, involved with safety of navigation and uh, nautical charting in the marine, and marine environment issues. Okay, uh, now let's continue. So at the, then, at the end of the day, uh, the goal is to make hydrospatial information available. And a definition that has been around for a few years is that spatial data infrastructure is the relevant base colleges, policies, and institutional arrangements that facilitate the availability of and access to spatial data. This is coming from the uh, Global Spatial Data Infrastructure Cookbook that has been around for a few years. And it describes the four pillars or four enablers of, a, of an SDI, which are also applicable to a marine SDI. And these are, as you can see on the left side of the slide, the policy and governance, which is basically the people that participate in creating this type of infrastructure with the rules and procedures uh, that uh, will be used to produce and share information, the technical standards that are very important and key to be able to exchange that information in a common language, uh, the geographic content, of course, without content, there is nothing, there is no products, and the information systems, the technology, and today we are, of course, going to focus on technology um, more than anything else. Um, but what we like to say is that a marine spatial data infrastructure based on those four pillars bring the marine dimension to an SDI, creating and creating data, converting that data into information, that information into knowledge, and hopefully this knowledge into wisdom. So after that definition, I would like also to mention another definition. You have heard me and you have seen in the title that we use the word hydrospatial. And this is a definition that I took uh, from my uh, friend and colleague, Denny Haynes, former director of the Canadian Hydrographic Service. And he presented a panel there uh, that discussed what's hydrospatial and you can see the link to the, his uh, presentation there that you can check later if you want to. And what I would like to highlight from this definition is that hydrospatial is marine geospatial data and information from the marine environment, the physical, biological, and chemical features of the marine environment to create these marine spatial data infrastructures. And from there, traditional hydrographic offices can evolve into this new model that would be a hydrospatial agency. And data collection and post-processing is very difficult and expensive. And this data is very valuable and mostly managed efficiently and should be used 
to the maximum, not just for one thing. An MSDI, I think, is the best way of doing that, that and it's the backbone of a hydrospatial agency. Many hydrographic offices around the world are embracing the MSDI concept. They are, and this concept is widely promoted by the international hydrographic organization, but it shouldn't be restrictive to national hydrographic offices, I think. Any agency collecting and managing marine geospatial data, producing information and sharing this type of information could follow the same concept. So hydrospatial is the evolution from a traditional hydrographic office or agency to a modern geospatial hydrographic agency. And usually bathymetry is the main asset that these organizations have. But they also manage other parameters. The focus here is the change in the way all this data can be used to create new products and provide new or better services. And for that, there are three key technological areas that, that they can use and take advantage of to evolve. One is automation for charting, for chart production, and other production processes. Number two is exploiting the ancillary data that they collect for new products and services. And the slide you can see temperature, uh, pressure, density, turbidity, uh, tides, etc. And number three, the use of artificial intelligence and deep learning that is becoming more and more prevalent in our field. Now let's talk about the four pillars that I mentioned a moment ago, or MSDI enablers. Starting with the policy and governance, and as I said, this is the people. Uh, the people that would be involved in developing uh, the marine SDI and all the documentation that will be used to base the cooperation among the stakeholders and the dissemination rules and all, all the ancillary considerations for that. And here I would like to mention three examples of useful guidelines to develop the governance pillar. And the first one that I'm showing in this slide is uh, the United Nations Integrated Geospatial Information Framework Initiative, or IGIF. And is the basis uh, and the guide for the geospatial information management. And this is based on nine strategic pathways that you can see at the center of the slide. And from those pathways, there is a, there are sets of documents that are being developed and can be created. So the first one is an overarching strategic framework or the reasons why this type of infrastructure needs to be created. Uh, the second set of documents at the next level is an implementation guide, which is the what needs to be done. And the third tier is at the country level, is the at the tactical level is the action plans, is how this is uh, done, uh, when this is needs, needs to be done, and who needs to do it. The second example that I want to mention today um, is the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a guide to develop uh, geospatial policies. Or in other words, geospatial information applied to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And for that, uh, ESRI has developed uh, an SDG data hub uh, to explore geospatially referenced data by goal. And you can see a screenshot on the left side of the, of the slide uh, for this data hub. And under that uh, screenshot, there is a link to the actual data hub that you can also check later if you want to. And on the right side, you can see the 17 uh, sustainable goals. Uh, sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. And from those, from the hydrospatial perspective, SDG 14, or Life Below Water, is directly related to the work we, we do in the hydrospatial domain, particularly the elevation and depth theme, which I think our main asset, bathymetry, is uh, critical information because everything else has to, put, has to be put into that context, into bathymetry. That's the reference frame for everything else. But I also want to mention here another more, more traditional product that is created by 
hydrospatial hydro agencies. And this is the nautical charts, which are, I think, fundamental for the transport networks theme, contributing, I think, with a, what I like to call the highways at sea for the maritime shipping. And also, I think that hydrospatial information impact other goals, and I added those with those red circles. So SDG 2, the zero hunger, SDG 3, good health and well-being, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, SDG 9, industry, innovation and infrastructure, and SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. And the reason why I want to mention those is because more than half of the population of the, uh, of the planet lives either at the coast or near the coast. So they are impacted for the blue economy activities. And the third example that I want to bring to your attention today is the IHO C17 publication, which is called the Spatial Data Infrastructures, the Marine Dimension, and are basically another set of guidelines for hydrographic offices to become hydrospatial agencies, although they don't really use the term hydrospatial, but that's essentially what they are recommending to do. And this document particularly mentions the concept of the blue economy, and, uh, is, uh, and they define it as the based uh, premise that um, a healthy ocean ecosystem uh, is more productive uh, and essential for sustainable ocean-based economies. So that's how they define the blue economy. And later, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, or the FAO, came up with something called the blue growth, which is uh, another concept that assists in the implementation of the blue economy agendas around the world. This document enumerates eight key drivers, and you can see them listed there. And um, I also want to mention that among those other things, uh, they mentioned INSPIRE, which is the SDI initiative in Europe, e-navigation, that I will talk a little bit uh, more in a moment, and, and they consider those uh, uh, climate change uh, repercussions in the ocean, like sea level rise and the population growth, which is also something uh, that everybody needs to take into account. So these three examples can be the basis for establishing local policies and guidelines for agencies looking into their responsibilities as hydrospatial data custodians and providers uh, for setting the way uh, they would like to cooperate and share information with other organizations, with the society, with industry, with other governments and, and, and et cetera, Any, anybody else. Now let's look at the second enabler, which is the data. We have identified as the main asset uh, for hydrospatial agencies, the bathymetry. This, this data must be stored and managed in enterprise systems and then made available. And I would like to show you uh, a good public example of a bathymetric data repository at a global scale. And this is the IHO Data Center for D Digital Bathymetry, or the DCDB, as is uh, well known. Uh, and this consists of more than 30 terabytes of single beam and multi beam unedited data from contributions from industry, from academia, from government agencies and also from crowdsourcing which is uh, a key aspect to contribute data for uh, for bathymetry mainly in those areas that is not available in any other way this center is uh, hosted by the u.s national oceanic and atmospheric administration in boulder colorado on behalf of the iho and it's one of the uh, cbet 2030s network of regional and global centers uh, and the, 20, the CBET 2030 project uh, is aiming at compiling all available bathymetric data to cover the entire seafloor by the year 2030. And you can see on the, on the screen uh, a, sh a little um, video clip of the IHO DB viewer, which is based on Esri technology. And this is the way in which people can discover and access bathymetric data. 
Now, usually national cartographic offices have the mandate to collect, maintain, and produce the authoritative and official bathymetric data of their national waters. And traditionally, these organizations have been focusing on using bathymetry for safety of navigation. In other words, for producing the nautical charts. But when you are building a marine spatial data infrastructure and becoming a hydrospatial agency, the use of bathymetry expands into many other areas. And that's the key message for becoming hydrospatial. I mentioned crowdsourced bathymetry, which is a very important source. And the IHO has developed a set of, uh, a set of guidance called the B12 publication. And you have seen a, a, a picture of the cover of that publication in the upper part of the slide. And this publication covers uh, basically instructions on how this data can be contributed by regular mariners using standard navigation instruments uh, while they are engaged in their routine maritime uh, operations traveling from one port to another. And last but not least, the metadata is also very important to make the data discoverable and uh, for the user to assess how this data can be used. And here we have our second poll of the day. If you please could respond to this question, what's the main type of data that you manage or you work with in your organization? And I can see that uh, there is a majority between bathymetry and nautical data. So very related to the things that we have been discussing so far. Let's continue with the presentation now. With the third enabler, the standards. Very important to establish the common language for interoperability and exchange. Uh, and the key organizations for developing standards uh, for a, an MSDI are, in my view, the Open Geospatial Consortium and the International Cartographic Organization. The OGC is a very large worldwide community that collaborate in developing geospatial standards for location information and services. And the OGC is made of uh, more than 500 government agencies, uh, including uh, government agencies, industry partners. Esri is a member of OGC and a founder of OGC, uh, research organizations and academia. And now I want to focus on the IHO and the IHO S100 series. S100 is a set of rules. It's called a universal hydrographic data model, but it's essentially a set of rules that tells you how to develop product specifications based on those set of rules. And in order to, and, and something very important is that uh, different from the old S57 standard, now they are more geospatial friendly. So they are aligned with the OGC standards now and the ISO 19100 series for geographic information. And in order to develop these new product specifications, the IHO has developed a registry and that registry contains individual registers per product specification and the rules on how to uh, develop those registers and work within the registry uh, is called the S99 publication and within those registers there are domains uh, like the hydrographic domain is one, ice coverage is another one, uh, there are different domains and series and the series is defined by the numbers so from S101 to S199 is the hydrographic series. And we see some examples of those new product specifications on the slide. The 200 series is for IALA, the International Association of Lighthouse Authorities. And you have the 300 series and the 400 series that include other ancillary information. For example, ice coverage is part of the 400 series, even inland ENCs are part of those 
400 series. And last but not least, the fourth enabler, the technology. As uh, I mentioned previously, uh, the technological developments of the fourth industrial revolution uh, um, are influencing the way these organizations are transforming. And these developments run at a very high speed. Some people say that technology grows exponentially. It, I think it has, been, it has been said many times in the past. But others think that the Moore's law is not applicable anymore. Uh, but regardless of that uh, debate, there is no question that the current uh, information technologies advancements allow organizations to do many things, many more things. There are more robust and reliable hardware with advanced software now using more and more artificial intelligence and deep learning that uh, can be used to take advantage of uh, processes of big data and this big data not only in terms of the volume of data but also the velocity of processing that data and the variety of data types which brings the possibility of creating an internet of things uh, to consume data of all different areas and things that you can think of. Many organizations, as I mentioned before, are creating their digital twin, which is basically their digital equivalents of the physical world, of the physical organization. Uh, the use of uh, virtual and augmented reality is also a trend. And I have seen uh, this applied in the laser navigation mainly, but it's being used in many other areas. So technology is what makes the MSDI concept and the hydrospatial concept materialize into something tangible. It's what makes data into information and knowledge and eventually into wisdom. And here's our third and last call of the day. If you could please respond to this question. What technical problem keeps you open? awake at night. Good. I see an overwhelming majority so far of upgrading old systems, so evolving really into hydrospatial with uh, data management and efficient production and dissemination very close together. I think by now we have a good idea of how organizations can transform themselves into hydrospatial agencies. And that is by building on the four pillars, by organizing hydrospatial data with the appropriate technology in a comprehensive way, uh, with more than one database, as many as needed. Like in this slide, showing a bathymetric information system for bathymetric data, a nautical information system for nautical information, basically meant for safety of navigation products, nautical charts and others, and an oceanographic information system for all the other ancillary data that these uh, hydrospatial agencies collect, like the sea surface temperature, water column temperatures, pressure, salinity, turbidity, uh, seabed classification, etc. And these databases are independent, but they are interconnected through an MSDI, enabling the combination of data sets for different products and services. And then developing the systems to manage these different uh, types of data, and finally converting this data into information uh, by creating many products and services, as I said. And also, that these products and services can be accessed in different ways. Some of them could be for free, some of them for a fee, uh, some information may be classified and restricted to specific users, etc. But the important thing is that the MSDI uh, enable users at all levels and of all different types. We like to classify users as advanced users or thick clients people that uh, work with the databases that produce the data, that analyze the data, and the uh, light users or thin clients, as we like to call them, that would be decision makers, policy makers, people that would 
access this information through an application for making a decision and moving on with their lives. So in transforming into hydrospatial, uh, as I mentioned in the standards uh, MSDI pillar, uh, by adopting the S100 standards, there are new products and services that can be provided. And in this slide, I, would, I want to talk about those new products and services following the e-navigation concept, from which the maritime services portfolios or MSPs can be developed through what is also called uh, a common maritime data structure. And this CMDS or common maritime data structure can be considered a subset of a marine SDI or can be connected to an existing CMDS if, if there is already something developed. The hydrospatial agency not necessarily has to create the CMDS can be connected to it and provide the products and services and services like those examples, those five examples that I have on the slide that I think are directly related to a hydrospatial agency. But what you can clearly see is that the role is not anymore constrained to producing nautical charts. And in some cases also the sailing directions and the notice to mariners and the tide tables and all the other related information, it's clear that the opportunity to evolve beyond that exists. Bathymetric surfaces, near real-time tides and currents, under the keel clearance management, marine protected areas, etc., can be used and can be consumed through these MSPs. And port authorities and administrations will benefit from this. The port pilots, the dredging operations, port security, the port services, port logistics, all of them will certainly be improved through these MSPs. And on the right side of the graphic, I like to show uh, the e-navigation concept for a single window where a ship or a shipping company can access these services from registered service providers before arriving the port. Uh, in this topic, uh, there are other important aspects involved that I haven't mentioned, like the IALA standards. Uh, I, I briefly talked about the, the series in the S100 universe, and the 200 series is part of IALA. And there are organizations like the Port CDM Council or the Collaborative Decision Making Council, which has recently created a new standard called the S211 for port call messages, which are standardizing uh, the, the sharing of uh, data on intentions and outcomes of movements of ships uh, and the services and the administrative events that needs to happen when a ship is arriving to the port. And this is just an example of the use of the universal photographic data model beyond the traditional, uh, uh, beyond the traditional missions of, um, of the hydrographic offices or now the hydrospatial agencies. Another important aspect when transforming into a hydrospatial agency is the support of ocean science. And remember when I mentioned a moment ago as one uh, possible database and oceanographic information system, well, this that you are seeing on the, on, on the slide now could be one application for it. And in this area, marine spatial planning and monitoring and coastal zone management activities are directly related to the blue economy and the blue growth and the sustainable development goals that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, in this example uh, of a product uh, using hydrospatial data, uh, I'm showing here something that we call the ecological marine units. And in the short video clip that you see on the left side, you can see uh, the EMU Explorer that can be accessed through the web browser uh, or uh, using an application uh, that uh, can be downloaded uh, from the Apple Store or the Android Store. And on the, uh, on the right, uh, you can see a 3D view of those EMUs in the Central American region. 
So those EMUs that you can see there, those, those cylinders that you can see there, each one of them represent an EMU. And they are uniformly distributed, uh, covering the oceans of the entire world in a one-fourth by a one-fourth of a degree or a 27 by 27 kilometers at the equator. And they are distributed in, in 37 uh, volumetric uh, regions. Uh, and each one of them, each one of these EMUs are divided into more than 100 depth zones vertically. And they are made from 52 million global measurements of six key ocean variables collected over a period of 50 years. And you can see the result of that, that is statistical analysis. And those variables are temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, nitrate, silicate, and phosphate. So with this example, I want to point out that hydrospatial agencies, and sometimes and in some cases together with other organizations, could create local EMUs or coastal marine units at a much larger scale with your own data, not with statistical observations, but with real time data. But the concept can be developed at that level of detail. So th something to consider to think about and how this would benefit the blue growth and the blue economy. So after talking about the concepts, the pillars, the databases and the technologies, I would like to show you some results. In other words, uh, the phase of the, a marine SDI or what users and customers will see and access uh, data and interact with uh, information products and to also potentially contribute to a marine SDI. So I have selected these four examples that you will show and later you will be able to look at them uh, by yourselves uh, if you want to explore them. So the first one is the Caribbean Geo Portal or CariGeo as it's also called. And this is the result of a previous initiative that was called the Project for Strengthening Spatial Data Infrastructures in the Caribbean. Uh, this project was from 2014 to 2018 and was funded by the government of Mexico with support of the government of Chile. And ESRI has created this geo portal to support uh, an open mapping community across the Caribbean uh, for all the nations in that region. And this particular uh, geo portal initiative is being led by uh, the National Institute of Geography and Statistics of Mexico and, and the University of West Indies in the Caribbean. And the overall aim is to ensure that uh, the initiative is sustainable in the long term, that agencies, including the hydrospatial agencies, can put their information available and also that there are tools for people to create maps, to do analysis and contribute with uh, their own uh, data. Now, let me show you a very interesting marine SDI uh, from the General Maritime Directorate in Colombia, or DMAR. Uh, I think uh, this is an organization in Latin America that is leading the way in, into becoming a hydrospatial agency. Uh, important to mention here is that they call their system the Maritime, Riverine and Coastal Spatial Data Infrastructure, which tells you how much area, not only in terms of geographical extent, but also in terms of data themes they cover in their portal. So in there, uh, you will find information, uh, of course, nowadays, uh, about the pandemic, first and foremost, you have a dashboard. And below it, uh, some important oceanographic and meteorological information, also in the form of dashboards. Uh, they also have a nautical charts catalog, uh, a zonification of their beaches along the, the Colombian coast. Uh, they have a very interesting application for maritime traffic awareness uh, along the Colombian ports. 
and also ways uh, to communicate important uh, projects and how also to interact with their community. The third example that I want to show you today is from one of the oldest hydrographic agencies in the world, but I think certainly one of the most forward-thinking organizations that I personally have seen evolving into the hydrospatial at a very fast pace since two or three years ago. And this is the United Kingdom Hydrographic Office Admiralty Marine Data Portal. In there, you will also see different sections. The first one with all the data sets that are available to the community, like ship routing and maritime limits, bathymetry and recs. They also have another section with specific applications that uh, cost customers can access to. And they have also paid services, not only for free, but also paid services there. And this section I think is very interesting. They have an APIs section for developers and a section for uh, uh, some satellite direct coastline data sets, uh, another section for bathymetric data samples to be downloaded, uh, frequently asked questions and ways to get in touch with them. And important to mention here is the Admiralty Vector Chart Service, or AVCS, that uh, provides worldwide coverage uh, with more than 15,800 ENCs online using ESRI technology, the Maritime Chart Service. And you will see a demonstration with that technology uh, uh, in a moment. And last but not least, uh, I would like to show you the Croatian Hydrographic Institute uh, portal of spatial data on the sea, uh, or what they call it also there, the Geo Adriatic. In this example, what I would like to emphasize is that they were able to ramp up this portal in record time. And from my perspective, this is an example of how the technology today can make the transition into hydrospatial relatively easy. If the organization has the data and the willingness to evolve, they don't have to be a big organization. The technology can adapt and can be flexible enough to address the needs of small, medium, and large agencies. So here you also have different sections. And all these geoportals are made with ESRI technology, so you can see some similarities, but also some differences. So they can sections to access their products and services, a news section where you can see the latest activities and what they are developing. Uh, and also very importantly for me is to see the, uh, their participation in their national spatial data infrastructure. And here, uh, is, this is just an example of a register of hydrographic surveys in the country, uh, because they not only perform surveys, they also allow companies and others to do surveys so people can access and see who is working where and what they're doing or when, or when that was performed. Uh, they also have an operational oceanography service that is in beta version that I think is also very interesting and you can check them out later if you want to. So I hope these four real life examples have, have given you an idea of what's possible when thinking marine, SDI and hydrospatial. So now let's uh, have a look at the technology. Uh, you will see some demonstrations, uh, very basic, very quick, uh, but I hope that this also gives you an idea of what's possible and, and what could be integrated to your current systems. So the first one that I want to demonstrate today is the Maritime Chart Server. Uh, this is an RGIS for server object extension. Uh, it displays vector nautical charts in S57 format directly without transforming into anything. Uh, and this is uh, like, uh, uh, can be provided as uh, REST services or representational state transfer services or OGC web map services. Um, there is a dynamic querying 
of this uh, rich data content in the uh, S57 data and is displayed with the S52 symbology. So here's a maritime trust survey. We are in the San Francisco Bay area. On the upper right hand, uh, you can see the tools, the basic tools of this service that can be configured. And here in the San Francisco Bay area, let's add another service so we can take advantage of the ENC data. So you can see here that there are many services in ArcGIS Online in the Living Atlas. Uh, you can search there or you can type a URL or if you have a file that you want to upload, you can also upload a file. So let's look for an AIS service. And we have several there. We are going to select our own demo AIS REST service. So when I add that service, you can see on the screen all the ships that appear on the San Francisco Bay Area. Zoom in a little bit. And I hope you can see on the screen. So if we want to query that information, we can query by point or by area. Let's query by point. I click on the ship and you can see the pop-up window with the information coming from the AIS service. This service is also provided by another uh, ESRI product, the Geo Event uh, Server Extension. And as we can query the boats, we can query the chart. So you can see there uh, a buoy, the light in the buoy, and the S57 attribution in the same service. So it's not just a background, it's not just pixels, it's real vector data. And we can see here the the two layers and the ENC layer that we can arrange, we uncheck the land area, which in an ENC normally has not much information. And we can add a, a different base map from our map gallery. We select imagery and now we have a combination of an ENC service with rich content on the water and a base map of imagery on land where we can also have rich content on land. So now let's say I also want to find out complementary information on bathymetry. And we look into what bathymetric services are available. There are many, as you can see there. So we look for the one that we like. And because I have checked this in advance, I know the details of these services and I know which one at this point is going to be ideal for the area that I am working with. So let's add this bathymetric attributed grid or back service from NOAA. And now you can see on the screen that there is a very high resolution bathymetry at the entrance to the San Francisco Bay. And we can play with this data, we can apply transparency to this particular layer so we can see through it the ENC data below it. I'm gonna move the ENC layer on top. And we can do the same thing Let's move the AIS REST service too. And we can do the same thing in the ENC layer. We can apply transparency to see the bathymetry below it. So we can do either way and combine and correlate information from, from two different services or three services. We are right now looking at three services. So in the properties uh, tools, we can adjust the depth contours. For example, we can change the safety contour. When I hit apply, you can see on the channel how the safety contour changes. We can also change the symbol size. And in the miscellaneous tab, we can also manipulate the display, uh, allowing different filters. Uh, some of them 
uh, emulate uh, an EGDIS or an ECS uh, in the way they, they perform. So we can select charts from specific usage band. We can, we can add a compass rows if we want. We can honor scheming, uh, et cetera. And in the color scheme, we can change it uh, from the traditional displays in an EGDIS. Like for example, we can uh, uh, change the dusk view or day black view or any other view that we can see there. Let's go back to day. Uh, we can also search specific features. We can serve, search by object name or by data set name. So we, because we know we are in San Francisco Bay, I search for the Alcatraz Lighthouse. And I can see that there are two objects in the harbor chart. So I click the first one and I go directly to that particular feature that I am looking for, which is the lighthouse in the Alcatraz Island. So these are just <clears throat> some quick examples of things that you can do with this service. Let's move up the AIS service so you can see the ships. And you can also do something with that service and play with the system developing a specific apps, for example, to show you the safety contour based on the draft of the ships. You can also set alarms for, for example, collision or, or run aground alarms or, or entering into marine protected areas, etc. So just ideas that you can do with this service. The second ex, uh, demonstration that I want to show you today is based on the RTIS bathymetry extension, which is a desktop extension, but some of the functionality can also be installed, can also be installed in server. And what you are seeing here is a web-based bathymetric information system using bathymetric attributed grids for this elevation service. So here it is. Uh, this is something that we call the BIS filter demonstration. And you can see here at the bottom of the screen, uh, the table with all the data sets that uh, constitute this specific elevation service, which is in the northeast coast of the United States. So we can minimize this so you can see the entire uh, data set there. And this is the explore bathymetry window. This is a set of filters. So you can filter the data uh, based on different criteria or properties. For example, if I type here a specific uh, data set or data file, you can see only that on the screen. Go back to the entire data set. And we can also filter the data by type. In this case, we only have bags, but if we had like vector data, we could do that there. We can filter the data by the cell size. Uh, we can also filter the data by the percentage of coverage in each one of the data sets. So from 80 to 100% data. Uh, we can also select vertical units. In this case, we only have meters. Uh, we can also select the sign. And in this case, we only have positive up enabled. Uh, the extended metadata, which is configurable, can be also used to filter this data set. So in this first one, we have the IHOS 44 uh, order for the surveys. So we can query based on that criteria, order one, order special order, etc. We can also filter the data by sensor. If we have different brands, uh, we can filter by the brand or the name of the sounder or the system that we use. We can filter also by ship. Uh, the name of the ship can be there and we can uh, use the platform for that. Uh, if we have different data types, single beam, multi beam or interferometric or marine LIDAR or satellite derived bathymetry, that can also be used to filter the data. If we had collections, we could also filter by collection name, another uh, collection uh, 
level metadata, but we are not going to use that because there is no data at the collection level. And I can show you that on the table. So you can see here that the columns of the collection metadata are empty. So there is nothing there. So we can use it for uh, this uh, filter window for querying the data in many different ways. We can also change the base map similarly to the maritime server. This is uh, something common in the platform. Select the ocean base map if we want to, but um, because the dark gray canvas is more contrasting to the bathymetry, let's keep that one. We can add other services other uh, services similar to what we did before. Uh, you can also select from a specific URLs, different types of services, or upload files, KML, CDS, etc. But let's find here an ENC service. So we have all the different services available. There are some from NOAA, using Azure technology, but let's use our own REST service here. And going to the layer list tab, we can move up our bathymetric data. And for example, what we could do here, if you receive new bathymetry from a survey, you can very quickly do a, a visual inspection and correlate your new bathymetry with the chart data below it. So in this example, I'm looking at the shawl there. And of course, in this case, it doesn't change. You can see a perfect correlation between the bathymetry and the shawl in the chart. So no problem. But if there was a discrepancy, you can see it right away. You can also develop apps. And this is one very simple elevation profile app from which you can select uh, the measurement units. Uh, we leave it like that in kilometers. And then from the profile result, we click a line on the screen on, on the service, double click at the end. And this elevation profile app is extracting the values from the service and will draw a, a profile of that line in a moment. Here there is. So if you hover the mouse on the on the uh, profile here on the graph, you can see the red X also moving to the corresponding geographic area along that line that we just draw on the screen. So it's just a simple app, but there are many other potential apps that you can create and you can uh, download if you want, you can export the results in a CVS file, you can do different things with it. You can create an app to create, for example, a different surface for dredging operations. There are many other things that you can do. This is just a basic um, usage uh, and just to give you examples and ideas. And the third example that I want to show you today is using a new standard called I3S. Uh, I, I3S stands for Index 3D Scene Layer Format and is very efficient for point cloud services. So you can use this format to rapidly stream and distribute large volumes of 3D GIS data that can be displayed in mobile devices, in web browsers, in desktop clients to continue producing and working with other data, uh, etc. So what I want to highlight here is the efficiency. So in this in this scene, uh, we are showing you 10.6 billion points from uh, topographic LiDAR and from multi-beam data. So first, uh, you can see the entire area. This is in Seattle, in the state of Washington in the US. And we go first here to the bathymetric data where we can see uh, what we are displaying here is 
raw contours before they are automatically smooth by the bathymetric solution and the pink are the uh, smooth contours and on the gland data uh, i like this specific uh, view because you can see the crane uh, uh, very well defined from the topographic glider and here you can adjust the daylight to any time of the day that uh, helps uh, to better represent your data in 3D and also from any day of the year. So we go to a rec area that has been identified from the multi-beam data here. As you can see, it's very well defined and we can also go uh, below it. So we can see the points and you can see there, hopefully you can see the points that are on top of that rack. In this other view that I have bookmarked, uh, I want to show you that you can create a ship model to give you an idea of the scale of the area, but we don't need it here. What I really want to show you here is the combination of the point clouds and the billion of points uh, that you can see on this scene and how efficiently uh, they are displayed. So let me show you here all the points, uh, mainly from the topographic area, from the land area. So hopefully you will see in your screens uh, how fast this is uh, displayed in real time. 10.6 billion points in the entire area, streamed online very fast, very efficiently. And this other demo is about uh, product on demand, which is part of the RGIS for Maritime Server extension that I showed uh, in the first demonstration. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's called product on demand because you can produce uh, paper chart like products using the S57 datasets as the source. And you can configure templates. In our case, we are using the IHO INT2 grids and symbology that is a combination of um, uh, the S4 uh, for paper charts and S52 for ENCs. But I want you to think about this as a potential future way of creating paper charts that are no longer the main product produced by hydrographic offices and that today consume a fair amount of resources producing. So let's look at the service here. <clears throat> this is uh, the same window that you see with a normal maritime server, but you will have some new tools. So let's go to a specific area. The maritime, uh, I mean the Monterey Canyon area here. Let's zoom in a little bit more so we can see the Monterey Canyon in the Monterey Bay area. You can see the hopefully of that canyon. Here we have similar tools uh, that we can configure uh, as in the regular maritime server. Uh, we we have. Uh, tools for adding other data sets, other service. Uh, you can add services either from your organization. In this case, uh, I will change that to the entire ArcGIS online from the Living Atlas. And I can see there there is a NOAA estuarine bathymetry. We select this estuarine bathymetry and we can see that now it covers the most part of the Monterey Bay area. Let's look for something else that can also show bathymetry on the exterior part. And we have a multi-beam bathymetric mosaic that very nicely covers the canyon that I was looking for. And now in the layers uh, tab, I can reorder and move up the storing bathymetry. And again, we can apply the transparency so we can see through the uh, 
the chart data. Uh, if we apply bathymetry, uh, apply transparency to the bathymetry on the outside part, now we can see through it also the soundings and contours underneath. So this is a new tab for this particular service. We can create a custom chart. We have we are consuming here three different services. So we can select the scale, let's say 40,000 scale. We can select the paper size, let's say a zero, big size, and the paper orientation. So let's leave it a portrait because of the orientation of the day. So with the select button, whatever I click is going to be the center of the polygon from which the system will extract the data. So here it is. And if we want to uh, reposition that polygon to cover exactly the area we want, we use this tool. And once it's positioned where we want it, we go to the export queue window, we type a name for this custom product. Let's call it Monterey Canyon. And then we just click the print button. So the system now is taking the data directly from the ENC service and from the other two services from NOAA that uh, we are uh, consuming. But let's now create a chart more like a chart. And we can do it from a fixed product. And we have two series, the 40,000 and the 80,000. Selecting the 40,000, we can see the footprint of that pre-existing product. And that could be a real paper chart product. And we just select that footprint. We go to the export window and we can see that the chart is ready with a product name because it's a product that already exists. So when we click the uh, print button, now the system is creating two charts, two Geo PDFs, one of a custom chart that didn't exist before, and one from a fixed product that was part of our catalog. And think about this as an alternative to create one-offs, like in the first example, uh, where some of your customers, uh, I'm thinking on the Navy, where they need tactical charts and specific purpose products for other agencies, but also the paper chart. And NOAA, that is uh, deprecating their paper chart production system, the traditional paper chart production system is looking into this technology to create their paper charts in the near future. So let's look at uh, the first chart. So we can see here that the chart has been created with the template that we have reconfigured. And you can see the three services reflected in this Geo PDF that you can print, but you can also use in, uh, in a GIS system because it's a Geo PDF, so it's, it's geo-referenced. And those are the notes that come with the NOAA ENCs. They are also printed by default, but they can be disabled if you don't want them. And now let's look at the paper chart-like product. And here it is. So let's zoom out so you can see the entire chart. And as you can see in the template, we have a not for navigation in red because, well, for now it's not for navigation. But think of it as a potential alternative for you to save time and money and resources in creating paper charts from ENCs automatically. And the IHO is currently discussing the future of the paper chart. And although the future is not clear for the paper chart, the only thing that I, I think is clear to me is that the future is not the same as we know it today. And technology enables you to liberate resources to become hydrospatial 
and to leave those traditional products to the machine to do automatically. Some food for thought at this point. And the last demonstration that I want to give you today is this Geo AI Shipwrex analysis, and this is using uh, deep learning algorithms that we have trained to uh, identify shipwrecks from uh, uh, some um, very uh, high density bathymetry from multi-beam in, in a back service in an area where we know that there are many shipwrecks and where they are. The algorithm has been trained and uh, it is uh, or it was last time I verified 95% uh, efficient. And from those shipwrecks, the system has extracted them and converted into S57 objects. And those S57 objects were directed into the nautical information system to update a chart. So let's look at it. This is the area where we know that there are many shipwrecks. And, and, and you are seeing here only the results. There is a, um, a webinar for this uh, coming in, in the future that uh, will show you the details on how we arrived to these results. So here are the layers uh, that contributed to this analysis. So here is the back uh, bathymetric layer, a very high resolution in this area. And let me zoom in a little bit so you can see the resolution there. So hopefully you will be able, able to see it in, in your screen. It's still refreshing. Here it is. I can see it now. So there are many wrecks there and the algorithm identified those wrecks. You can see them highlighted in red, right there. Those are the known shipwrecks. Let's get closer so you can see them. And now let's look at the Geo AI analysis, the result. So here they are. So you, what you're seeing now over those shipwrecks in the uh, bathymetry layer are the S57 objects. And let's use this swipe tool so you can see the shipwrecks directly from the bathy data and the shipwrecks identified and extracted by the artificial intelligence. Here, compared to the ENC, so you can see those S57 objects will be used now to populate an ENC product. There they are. And if you want, because they are S57 objects, you can query them. And we can see the S57 attribution because the algorithm not only identifies the regs, it identifies the depth and is also portrayed there in the minimum depth over that track. So this is just a result of working with uh, that uh, deep learning algorithm. Uh, if you want to learn the details on how this was created and how this worked from the survey data, extracting, identifying automatically the shipwrecks and extracting them. There is a webinar coming up that you can uh, attend. And now I will give the floor uh, to my friend Sean that patiently has been waiting uh, to give you a demonstration of voxels and the use of NetCDF for multidimensional analysis. So, Sean, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for all of the great intro as well, Rafael. 
So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to be showing the voxel, the new voxel layer, which will be released in the upcoming release of ArcGIS Pro 2.6. And in that release, we have enabled the use of volumetric data for soils, atmospherics, water, and other voxel data, point data in GIS. This permits the exploration of billions of voxels along with any other GIS in 3D. It supports discrete and continuous symbology, and the initial release will be only in ArcGIS Pro. The support for data types will be for NetCDF or geostatistical analytical layers as inputs. So this is the interface for ArcGIS Pro. So voxel layers will allow users to represent multidimensional, spatial, and temporal phenomena as 3D volumetric visualizations. Voxel layers can be used for X, Y, Z, X, Y, T, or X, Y, T, Z dimensions. Examples of this are scientific, or oceanographic data, geological or subsurface models, or space-time cubes as voxel layers. In today's demo, we're going to be focusing on ocean data, and we'll give an overview of what can be done with that type of data. As Raphael mentioned earlier, Esri worked with the USGS and others to create the Ecological Marine Unit data set. And that, as you saw, was represented by points, 52 million of them all together with, three, with six key variables or over, collected over a 50 year period. So to begin, we'll create a local scene. So this is a flat local scene in WGCS 84. We'll go and we will add data. So the data that we're going to be using is the point data in NetCDF format, and it's a multidimensional voxel layer. Uh, we bring up the voxel layer interface, and then going to our set of data, it's, you can see it's NetCDF, and it is for the EMU version 4. We we'll add that, and that brings up a dialog where we get the option of adding all of these different variables, both continuous and discrete. And for this example, we'll be looking at the percentage oxygen and the temperature, and we'll create the oxygen as default. And once we've done that, we'll click OK. And we are quickly have that layer added. So if I turn it on, you can see that it has been rapidly rendered across the whole of the globe. And you can see we have the uh, base map, as Raphael mentioned earlier, we have the uh, base map uh, that we can change up here depending on what you want to show, but for this particular set, we'll just use the uh, standard uh, imagery base map. Turning off the imagery base map, you can see that it, the data goes all the way to the depths of the ocean and outlines the continents as well. So in this scenario, we wish to show temperature and fractional saturation of oxygen and we want to make the uh, oxygen our default. So any of these values you can click on, you can see that the uh, saturation of oxygen is, is uh, on there and available as well. So taking this, we'll generate some surfaces and so you can generate a number of different surfaces. You can generate an isosurface around a specific defined value or threshold, sections with horizontal or vertical planes, which it can be per 
positioned and edited as I desire. And slices of the voxel can also be created to create areas of interest. So if you don't wish to display this whole set of data, you can slice the voxel into smaller areas, reducing the volume and uh, amount of power usage on your, on your machine. Sections can also be locked to create snapshot in space time for comparison with other variables. So I'll be just demonstrating all of these in this particular set. So switching from volumes to surfaces, we see that we have ISO surfaces and sections. To begin with, we'll start with a section. And to create a section, we get either the ability to create a vertical or horizontal section. In this case, I'm going to create a vertical section and slice directly from north to south. And then the same from east to west. And we now have the section of those voxels selected out. We can then lock these sections. And that way, the, the, these do not change as we navigate around. And now I want to change a set of uh, isosurfaces. So to create an isosurface, what I want to do is I want to change the uh, so I want to change the uh, go from fractional saturation of oxygen to the seawater temp, and in doing so, we can now create an isosurface and defining the temperature range. We'll go from 15 degrees and select a color for that. And then we can create another one. And we'll go and look at 25 degrees. And with these two surfaces, you can see that we can have created, we can actually change the transparency. So we can see how the other layers interact with those um, with those layers so you can see the break off points between the slices in the voxels and the isosurfaces that have been created. So that is generating voxels and navigating voxels from a set of NetCDF data. What other types of data are supported? Well, at this time, as I said, NetCDF is the main import data type. But we can also take point data. In this case, we have a subset of, the, uh, of NOAA's uh, ocean data set. And these are points which have temperature and oxygen in their, in their collection. And we can turn this into a geostatistical layer. So what we want to do is we want to use Krigging to select each point at the different depths to create a surface. And once we've created our surface, we can then take that surface and generate a voxel layer out of that. So just to show you the, the Krieg surface, this is the, the surface. And we can see it, we can generate slices of that surface going all the way down through the points. And the same for oxygen. And then we take that particular data 
and combine it in the uh, in the Krigging tool or in the output tool, which generates a voxel for us. So we have our input geostatistical layers and then the output gridded points. And then from that we get are able to generate the voxel with the same set of data and the ability to navigate, slice, generate ISO surfaces, uh, and do other types of voxel or uh, visualization and analysis of that data. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we have we also enable time within the voxel layer as well. So this is one of the subsets of the EMU data set, and it is for the North Atlantic uh, off the coast of the US. And here we have the, over time, the change in temperature of the Atlantic and the effects of the Gulf Stream on, at different times of the year. So that's for the, the volumes in the surfaces. We can look at the same for the depths of particular temperatures at different times of the year along the coast and out into the ocean as well. So that's a simple and beginning introduction to the capabilities of the voxel layer within ArcGIS Pro. This will be the initial release in 2.6. We are in the finalizing of the Im implementation of this, so it will be released around UC time. And if you're interested in attending or finding out more about voxels and their your use and creation, there is a live streaming event workshop on at the virtual UC coming up in July, and that will be taking place on Wednesday, July 15th from 2.50 through 3.50 Pacific time, and that will cover all of the details in regards to producing, uh, analyzing, and outputting voxel layers as well. If you're interested in looking at or are already on the beta pro process and have uh, use of the ArcGIS Pro product. There are a number of examples of the different data sets available. So this is the marine ecological unit example data set. And then for those of you who are interested a little bit in uh, geology, we also have a set of uh, geological data from uh, the Netherlands uh, Geological Survey. So with that, I'll finish up and hand back to Phil. And thank you very much for your attention. And look forward to hearing if you any of your questions or comments on the voxel there for the upcoming release. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, Sean. Very good presentation. So what you have seen in those uh, series of demonstrations, first the ones that I provided were what we can call the uh, uh, thin clients or the lighter users where you access services provided by the hydrospatial organization and somebody else interacts with it to make a decision and to do some, some sort of analysis. What you saw on Sean's demonstration is for advanced users using our RTIS Pro desktop application where you can build uh, those products and do uh, further analysis and more complex uh, functions that later will be part of those lighter services that others will consume online. Uh, I would like to finish uh, uh, our webinar with some take-home messages. 
of all the things that you have seen today. And the first one that I have in this slide is that uh, the nature um, and the technological changes, I want to say nature is the environment <laughs> and the technological changes bring those new challenges that we have discussed and also these new opportunities to evolve and use the technology to address those new, new challenges. Uh, the hydrographic agencies are evolving from traditional roles of safety of navigation and chart production, getting more responsibilities and being the custodians and producers of marine geospatial information or hydrospatial information. Uh, a marine spatial data infrastructure is the mean to become a hydrospatial agency through those four pillars. that I described during the web the right way and in order to do that you have to be agile to implement those changes that are required and also be open-minded so not only uh, keeping doing what organizations have been doing uh, in the past but also open to new ways of doing things and here I'm specifically thinking of paper truck production for example the technology allows for the change without needing more resources and that I think I hope that I demonstrated it with the uh, Geo Adriatic geoportal from Croatia uh, and finally enabling hydrospatial data and information products to the largest largest extent is the end so if a marine spatial data infrastructure is the mean enabling these information products is the end and an organization evolving into hydrospatial is the way of doing that and with this uh, we would like to thank you for your attention for being with us for one and a half hour and uh, i know we have uh, extended our presentation for a while uh, i don't think we have much time for questions there is one uh, that I will be very quickly respond. The question is how this MSDI uh, be used as the complementary, uh, as complementary to navigational charts or ENCs. Well, the marine SDI is a way to produce those ENCs and to produce complementary products that can be used in combination with ENCs ashore and also uh, on board, but. Uh, the systems that ESRI provides and a marine SDI would not replace an egg. This would be like a, an additional tool that could be used on the back of the bridge for planning and decision making processes without uh, distraction to the mariner that, uh, that is on the bridge uh, navigating and, and in charge of the security of the navigation. But MSDI is, uh, is a way to create those products, those ENC products and beyond. Uh, in and, and in doing it in more efficiently and also providing them to the public more efficiently and not only to the traditional customer which is the mariner but also to other customers the public in general oceanographers uh, coastal zone managers uh, coastal engineers to anybody and with that I think uh, we are finished we are done with the presentation today Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, there is another question there for the availability of this webinar later, and I will uh, give the floor to Kelly to, to give us information about that. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. A big thank you to our presenters today, and thank you very much for attending this webinar on transforming an MSDI into a modern hydrospatial infrastructure. And once again, a recording will be made available within the next week to you, and we will send that out via email along with the uh, presentation slides for your reference. And you can always email us with any additional questions at the email you see on your screen there, maritime at esri.com. And once again, we thank you for attending. Have a great rest of your day.